Next, up, next up is uh, Dr. Robert Demeff, uh, one of our partners at UT Southwestern. Mark Woodruff, orthopedic surgery, is a professor of orthopedic surgery, pediatric surgery, and family practice, family medicine. Uh, he's previously he's previously the team physician for the Cleveland Browns. Uh, since his uh, departure and arrival in da Dallas, he's now the team physician for the Dallas Stars and also our medical director of sports medicine. Uh, I asked uh, I asked Bob Robert to talk on this subject uh, several years ago, but we, I couldn't catch him. He was always uh, out somewhere in the United States uh, lecturing. So we have the pleasure of having him here today. And he's going to talk to us about uh, something that's uh, also a your convention and the treatment of chronic tendinopathy uh, is the uh, EPAT, the extracorporeal uh, extra pressure activation therapy. Bob? Thanks, Ty. Good morning, everybody. How many people here do shockwave therapy? Okay, so a half a dozen or so. Um, hopefully by the time we leave, most of you will incorporate it into your practice. So these are my disclosures. There's nothing that really should um, affect this presentation. And this is an overview I'm going to recover in the next 20 minutes. And I think they passed out the handouts this morning, so all the slides should be in there. I did update a couple of things. So first of all, why shockwave therapy? Well, back in the 1960s, uh, they started to study the effects of shockwave on humans. Um, and they developed this concept that direct pressure or damage from ultrasound may cause injury to tissues and stimulate healing response either by directly destroying the tissue or by causing this negative vacuum effect that causes the cells to rupture. That's kind of the concept behind the, the theory of shockwave therapy. It was first used for uh, lithotripsy back in uh, 1980 and then the Ocitron, a high energy ultrasound uh, or shockwave device, uh, was shown to improve a variety of tendinopathy conditions and then in 2000, the Ocitron was approved by the FDA. So we've had it here in the States uh, for 14 years now. This is the uh, lithotripsy device. You know, this thing's about $3 million uh, to break up kidney stones. Uh, very painful, and they have to get this big tub and such. And over the course of time, like everything with technology, things have improved, and the devices are now smaller and easier to transport. So what's the physics behind why this may work? So this is a, uh, a pressure wave of the, of, uh, from the shock wave uh, that's delivered, and basically you get this ultrasound pulse. There's a very rapid, high uh, increase in pressure locally. It's very short duration, a millisecond or so, and then you have this negative uh, pressure so that the cells are in almost a vacuum. So the concept is they may rupture um, with the, in that, during that uh, negative pressure. So either, either the energy damages the cell, or there's this negative vacuum effect, and you end up with some cell damage, hematoma, that stimulates a healing response. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, there are basically four different types of machines out there. There's super high energy that requires anesthetic. It's too darn painful to do without anesthetic, whether that's a local, a, a regional, or general anesthesia. Uh, but there's a whole variety of different uh, uh, devices, whether that's electrohydraulic, electromagnetic, piezoelectric, and then finally the ballistic, which are the more recent uh, players in the market that have uh, come out in the last oh, seven or eight years now. And so that's the that's the that's uh, uh, how the force is delivered to the tissues. So as I mentioned, the the there's a number of theories in terms of why this works, but at the cell level, uh, one of the things, it may be that the shock wave changed the nerve cell permeability, inhibits effort nerve fiber, so it's let, so you don't hurt as much. And anybody who's done shock wave realizes if you treat properly, people feel better right away. There's an anesthetic effect involved, and that's what that's related to affecting some of the uh, uh, pain-generating compounds, such as substance P, calcitonin gene-related protein, glutamate, and others. Maybe we en enhance angiogenesis, bring increased blood supply to the area to stimulate a healing response. There's some basic science works that suggest that there's a inflammatory healing response. It's actually a good response in terms of trying to generate appropriate collagen for tissue repair. Uh, such that they end up with more fibrosis or more tendon healing. And then finally, we all know that there's this neovascularization with the tendons, which we think carry the small fibers that are the source of the pain, and perhaps what the shock wave does in those conditions of chronic tendinopathy is destroys those blood vessels. Subsequently, the nerves traveling with them result in less pain. So those are some theories in terms of how it works. Now, what, is, what, is, what about Achilles tendonitis specifically? So, if we look at the devices, you've got the, the Ocitron, Dornier, and the Sonicure devices. These are relatively high energy, usually require, as I say, do require anesthetic. One of the problems is, if you use an 
anesthetic, you don't know exactly where to treat the condition. Um, the pain response from the patient is very helpful in terms of where to focus your treatment. And so if you have a under general or a regional block, you don't know where to treat. So what's done is generally the skin's marked where the person says, oh yeah, that hurts, that hurts, and, and you treat that area. The device also has an ultrasound built in so you can actually see the tendinopathy and guide your treatment based on the ultrasound. But my experience is the ultrasound doesn't always correlate, usually doesn't correlate with all the areas I treat. So just because you see this area of tendinosis doesn't mean you only need to treat that. You may need to treat more of the tendon, and that's been my general practice for 10 plus years doing this. Then there's, <coughs> excuse me, then there's some of the uh, smaller devices, uh, the Dolorcast and the, the Stores EPAP, which is uh, full disclosure, that's the device I currently use now. And then I also have access to the Zimmer device, which is recently released, um, and I'm just sort of experimenting with that at this point in time. Uh, back in 2006, we did a, a, a review on shockwave therapy. Sims was the lead author and uh, looked at all the shockwave at that time. And the problem is, it's really hard to, you can't even blind patients to this. You can't do sham shockwave because you know if you're hurting and you know you're getting the treatment or not. But that's what the, um, that's what the FDA, uh, I'm sorry, that's what the insurance companies want to see. They want to see these double blind randomized controlled trials to show that the, the problem is you can't blind this treatment. Um, it really depends on who your patients are, how much energy you deliver. The, the research is all over the uh, place in terms of frequency of treatment, how often you treat, um, whether you use an anesthetic or not. And as Ed pointed out in his study, the Hawthorne effect is very real. Anybody involved in a study is going to get better just because they're participating in a study. So they do all the other stuff they're supposed to because they want to get well, whether they get the actual uh, intervention or not. So at that time, we looked and said, there's some positive effects in the literature on a variety of different tendinopathies. There's some studies that show that it doesn't work, but uh, it certainly seems to have a role uh, in a whole host of, of uh, overuse type of conditions, whether that's plantar fasciitis, epicondylitis, calcific rotator cuff tendinitis. What I found it also works for, for simple rotator cuff tendinopathy without, cal without calcification. Quad patellar tendinopathy, glute medius and surgical tendinopathy, the high energy ones can work for stress fractures and non-unions as well. There's a little bit of evidence that maybe the lower energy or the EPAT may help with the non-unions as well. So everyone in this room knows the Achilles tendinosis uh, uh, patient. Uh, you can either have that acute peritina, which tends to happen in the younger folks, uh, more of a, uh, the proximal, uh, which is the more common one that we see two to six centimeters from the insertion, that watershed area, or the insertional, which is really a pain in the neck to deal with. I think most of you would agree that's tough to get rid of. There's a whole host of risk factors based on, on genetics, appearance, age, medication, supplements, training schedules, um, all sorts of things that are risk factors for Achilles tendinosis uh, and acute tendinitis. Everybody in this room knows treatment. There's a whole host of things that we do for Achilles tendinosis. Uh, and, and tendinitis. Probably the most important one is the eccentric exercises popularized by Alfredson 20 years ago. Seems to be the most critical thing uh, in treating uh, plantar or in treating Achilles tendinitis. But there's a whole host of things that we um, try in a stepwise fashion to get folks better. Um, cold laser, uh, we're using it as well for, for Achilles. Um, nitroglycerin patch, which has some good data. Um, the PRP, the platelet plasma injections, I do those as well for this. Prolotherapy, injecting sclerosing agents and sugar water, all sorts of things to try to stimulate a healing uh, response. High volume, uh, normal saline injections. Uh, Nick Foley out of England has been doing that for a number of years, basically just separating the peritinon from the Achilles tendon, and it shows some good results with that. So there's a whole host of things that we certainly do for this. Now there's one recent study looking at um, an, animal's, uh, an animal model, specifically of Achilles tendinosis, or tendinitis I should say. Basically what they did is they used collagenase and they busted up the Achilles tendon of a bunch of rats. And then one group got shockwave, uh, one group got a sort of wait and see, relative rest, and then the other was just a, uh, a non-treatment control. And over the course of time, over the course of days and weeks, the shockwave group did better in terms of a healing response compared to the wait and see group. Now recognize what this is, it's collagenase damaging the tendon, it's not the overuse that we typically see in the humans. So what does the literature show us in terms of 
specifically shockwave for Achilles tendonitis. There have been two meta-analysis done in the last four, uh, three years. Um, Alphabot just published this last year. So they looked at 83 studies of Achilles tendon tendonitis treatment with shockwave, all types, minimum three-month follow-up. Within that, they had four randomized controlled trials. So we're not talking about a lot of uh, great studies out there. And as I said, the, the, the part of the problem is it's really difficult to blind these treatments. You see the variation in terms of the amount of energy delivered and the number of impulses, anywhere between 1,500 and 2,500. And what they were able to summarize from this uh, limited literature was that there seems to be satisfactory evidence for the effectiveness of low energy uh, extracorporeal shockwave therapy to treat both chronic and insertial tendonitis at three months. And it seemed to be better with eccentrics, and I think I emphasized that earlier, that eccentrics are the cornerstone of treatment, and so adding the shockwave Adding the eccentrics to the shockwave seems to make it better. And then Kearney, back in 2010, looked at insertial Kelly tendinosis. Um, 118 studies. Uh, they found 11 that they uh, included in the studies. And they excluded anything that was sort of biased, narratives, case reports, that sort of thing. And they found a whopping six surgical cases that were all retrospective and five conservative series, only one of which was a randomized controlled trials. And they summarized that shockwave therapy and eccentric training uh, seem to lead to a favorable result in those five studies. Whereas operative uh, results were retrospective and inconclusive. I think most of you who operate on this would agree. Um, you got a 50-50 chance of getting better. Now what about some specific studies? They started showing up in the literature over a decade ago. Um, the, um, you know, for Achilles uh, tendon treatment Costa in 2005 published on uh, 49, randomized, 49 patients randomized to either shockwave therapy or sham therapy. And remember what I said, if you do sham therapy, you're just not delivering any energy. The, the machine's making a lot of noise, and, but no energy is being delivered, but you don't know where to focus the treatment. And so, it, like I said, it makes it difficult to truly be um, uh, blind. And they, they showed uh, improvement of 21 points on the uh, uh, VAS scale in the shockwave group versus just five in the uh, sham group one month after the last treatment. Furia back in 2005 did a double blind randomized control trial of 67 cases. They used high energy uh, shockwave with either a block um, or eccentrics and then measure the VAS. So, so this is when you're, uh, this is the high energy. This is not EPAP, but this is high energy ultrasound. And you see the numbers on the left are from shockwave group and obviously significant improvement in the pain scale with shockwave versus just doing eccentric exercise over the course of time. And at the end of the trial, there were more patients in the, in the good and excellent result in the shockwave group. We're asking in 2008. Uh, double blind randomized control trial of 48 cases of either shock of either shock wave or sham therapy for three treatments, and uh, they followed at one, two, and three months. In the shock wave group, did better at all uh, at all points. Their functional scales improved more significantly than the sham group. And in this study, was the first one that showed that women seemed to do better in this treatment group than the males. Rompi, who's done much of the work on shock wave, he's from Germany. He's published at least 30 articles, good trials on shockwave for all sorts of things. And in 2007, he took on Achilles tendonitis, non-insertional, uh, double blind, double blind randomized control trials, 75 cases. Uh, and they either got shockwave or eccentric training or wait and see attitude, nothing. And at four months post-treatment, 52% uh, uh, of shockwave, 60% of the uh, eccentric group and 20 percent of the wait and see group were either much improved or completely recovered. And then Volpiani in 2009, 125 cases, that's the case series, um, uh, using the EPAT, that's the extracorporeal pulse activation therapy. Um, patients age range from 18 to 74. So here's where some of the variability comes in. They did anywhere between three and five treatments. They gave between 1,500 and 2,500 impulses. They delivered between 0.08 and 4 bar. Uh, they did it every two to seven days, and many of the patients were satisfied or very satisfied and follow up at two months. Some were followed at six to 12 months, some at 12, uh, at 12 to 24 months. They lost patients, they went to the trial. But, but uh, anyway, this is one of the difficulties in looking at this literature is everybody does things a little bit differently 
In other words, they treat, treat patients, they don't follow uh, study protocols, and that's been my experience as well, is you don't just set the device on a certain energy and leave it there, you make the adjustments as you go along, so this is kind of real life what we end up doing. Now moving on to insertional, uh, Fury in 2005 did a double blind randomized controlled trial of 68 cases, high energy shockwave, either with a local block or a regional block, so they either did a, uh, 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 a post, uh, either post-tib uh, nerve block or simple local anesthesia around the heel. And interestingly, in their trial, the group that got the block did better than the group that got the local, uh, and both did better than the uh, usual treatment. And likely this is simply because they were, I think, probably better able to treat the patients because they probably had better pain control uh, while delivering the uh, impulses. And then Rompi looked at insertional uh, Achilles tendonitis in 2008, uh, 50 patients that had over six months of failed treatment, including injections. They do lots of cortisone injections in Europe, which we get a little bit nervous about. But um, the, um, you know, they obviously got their eccentric exercises, and they did radio shockwave therapy, their EPAT. Uh, you see the, the treatment there, and their pain scales improved significantly in four months uh, versus the uh, routine group, and the pain levels uh, improved significantly over the course of time in the 15-month follow-up. Now, what, what if you add something else to the shockwave? So this device, uh, so uh, Nota Cola in 2012 added a supplement to the shockwave. So the group got the EPAT treatment, and then they had this supplement which included arginine, collagen, MSM, vitamin C, bromelain, and vinitrox, which is a, uh, which is a supplement that you can buy. And simply by adding the supplement, significantly more people did better in their overall uh, function and pain scale by adding this supplement. Um, so the idea behind these things are these are you know collagen precursors, et cetera, whatever it might be, uh, that you help stimulate healing response. So if you want to add something to your shockwave therapy, uh, you can uh, consider this supplement. And then Sexine in 2011 looked specifically at the EPAT device for Achilles tendonitis in, in 60 patients, and they had they had 12-month uh, follow-up. And in sorry, and in this group, um, uh, and in this group, they, they separated them out into peritinon, proximal, and insertial Achilles tendonitis. And you can see the good next results uh, sort of show that this seemed to be effective in this group, but there was no control. This is a case series. Now, just in the last three minutes, um, adverse effects. A couple things uh, to look for when you're treating. If, you, if, if the pain is poorly localized or diffuse, it doesn't tend to work as well. Make sure you have some recent imaging so you're not dealing with a stress fracture or something else. There's concerns about pregnancy, but you, it, it, and that basically has to do with the fact that sometimes people become vagal and faint. You don't really want a pregnant woman fainting in your office, so that may be a reason why not to do them in pregnancy. Um, be careful on younger folks, be careful with open growth plates, although I've treated folks with open growth plates. Um, you, you don't have to worry about implantable defibrillators and pacemakers because your device is away from the leads, but if you do something around the chest, you have to be concerned. The other thing is I always, I almost always get some labs on these patients to make sure they're not vitamin D deficient, make sure they're not hypothyroid, uh, make sure that they're not iron deficient. These are things I've found over the course of time that I generally would try to fix those before I end up shocking them. Um, if they have inflammatory disorders, if they're bleeding disorders, Coumadin, you know, they can have some bleeding associated with it, which I don't think is all that bad. I consider that internal PRP, I guess. Um, if they have an open wound, there's some concerns, but the reality is, uh, two minute warning, the reality is that uh, this device can actually be used to improve wound healing. Importantly, if the patient's uncooperative and has a low pain tolerance, they don't do, tend to do too well. They're screaming and moving all over the place, and you can't focus your treatment too well. These are the adverse effects that, you, that, that you're going to see. Pain, I tell them it's going to hurt. Um, the description I use is like I stick a needle in there and I hit, hit it with a ball peen hammer. That's what it feels like. I've had the treatment for a lot of different things, and, and it hurts for about 10, 15 seconds, and gradually the pain goes from a 9 down to a 5 or 6, and it's manageable, then we continue to retreat the area uh, with that. So it hurts an awful lot. Um, nausea, common, back pain is common because they tend to tense up their muscles. Um, I've had a couple of patients who have become vagal and fainted. Um, you can get some bruising and discoloration over the site. I, I don't worry about it too much. We're trying to get them healed. Uh, but those are the, some of the common adverse effects. 
There have been a few uh, Achilles tendon ruptures reported in the literature. One was a 49-year-old female who had an osteotomy for Hagler's deformity, developed Achilles tendonitis a couple years later, had shockwave and ruptured her tendon a, uh, a couple months after the shockwave therapy. Was that related to the shockwave therapy or the age and effects? She didn't do well. And then in one series, there were two males over the age of 60 who had supposedly bad tendinosis who went on to rupture with minimal eccentric um, uh, mechanism. So the last 30 seconds, here's my experience, um, or I would summarize, choose your patients wisely, make sure they don't have any kind of metabolic or nutritional disorders, be careful the obese, perimenopausal female with bilateral symptoms, those folks don't tend to get so well with this. I think high energy is probably better than the low energy. Anesthetics will interfere with your treatment if you use a local, so I generally don't use a local, and the more energy you can deliver, the more you hurt them, the better they do. In my personal experience, when I first got the device, um, I looked at my, my patients and about 80 to 90% Achilles tendon were improved in three months. My insertionals did not do as well. I had about 25% that did well, 50% that were a little bit better, 25% that were mad at me that they paid a lot of money and were no better. Since then, what I've done is I've gone to doing every other week treatment for insertional Achilles tendinosis, and the results have been better and are more reflective of what's um, in the literature. But I think it's, uh, I think it's safe, and if, if, you re if they have symptoms at three months or 12 months later, I have no problems with, with retreating them. So uh, this is a summary. Um, I think shockwave is safe and effective. Uh, you have to be careful, uh, active versus inactive people. Um, do some lab work potentially before you do shockwave. And certainly, I think it's a, a reasonable step before doing surgery. And clearly, like everything else, we need more uh, evidence. Thank you very much. Thanks for time. All right, again, we'll have the question and answer session at the end.